All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I am grateful that you are here. Um, tonight, we are going to do a deep dive into the February 2022, um, into the February 2022 performance test that was called In Ray Price. Um, give me one second and I'm going to get the PDF of the document pulled up and I will post a link to it in the chat so that you all um, can follow along as well. So give me one second and I will post the link to that in the chat. Hopefully you all have had a chance to have a look at it though prior to. All right, so there is the link and you wanna scroll all the way down to the PT, which I can tell you which page number it's on. I'll give you all just a moment to download that. Okay, and the PT begins on page of the PDF starts on page nine is where the instructions and file are. Um, Okay, so let me share my screen. Hopefully everybody has the PT pulled up and you can follow along. And now here is, um, now you should be able to see my screen. I have a PowerPoint that's up right now. Um, so hopefully you all can see that. All right, so tonight we're gonna talk about a few things. So these are the goals for today. So understand the PT process, uh, understand the PT process, understand really how a PT is put together and also how to organize a PT, how to organize a PT. So we're gonna get into these things and we're gonna, it's really the goal is for you to understand these things within the context of the February, 2022 performance test. So first, first, um, actually, I'm gonna show you all something else first. So I'm gonna switch over to showing you the actual PT from February briefly. So first I wanna just point out one thing. So if you weren't aware, if you weren't aware, there was a change to the instructions of the February 2022. Um, well, in February 2022, there was a change to the instructions of the performance test. And this is fairly significant. It's fairly significant because you have to look for this each time. And it was absolutely relevant on this administration of the bar exam. So if you go down to the instructions, if you go down to the performance test instructions, what changed was instruction four. What changed was instruction four. So it says instruction four, the file consists of source documents containing all the facts of the case. The first document is a memorandum containing the instructions for the task you are to complete. The other documents in the file contain factual information about your case and may include some facts that are not relevant. Facts are sometimes ambiguous, incomplete, or even conflicting. As in practice, a client's or a supervising attorney's version of events may be incomplete or unreliable. Applicants are expected to recognize when facts are inconsistent or missing and are expected to identify sources of additional facts. So I just wanna point this out because this was a change that came up in February, 2022, they did change the instructions and this instruction was relevant for the February, 2022 performance test. So I just wanna point that out, that that is something that I'm gonna be talking about a bit tonight. For those of you that were in my PT course, um, I, we did talk about this and we did a little bit of practice um, with this type of work with identifying conflicting or ambiguous or incomplete facts and what to do. So I just wanted to point that out briefly and we will come back to that. But first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about uh, the PT process. Does somebody have a question about that? No, okay. So the very first step, and we're gonna walk through a lot of this, we're gonna walk through um, uh, this process. So the very first step, which most of you probably know, is to review the task memo. Notice that I don't say to read the instructions prior to, you all should read through the instructions just now-ish, I mean, not right right now, but before you take the exam, just to be familiar with them. Um, and then you don't have to read them again. We'll wanna double check and make sure that none of the instructions changed again. Um, but you do want to at least have read those instructions once. You wanna have read those instructions once. 
So then step one is to review the task memo. And there are five things that you're trying to identify when you review the task memo. You wanna understand what is the task that's been assigned? What's the task? You're writing a memo, are you writing a brief, are you writing a closing argument, a letter to a client, a letter to opposing counsel? Those are the five most common tasks. There's other ones too, but those are really the five most common and you need to know how to do those 100% very, very easily. So review the task memo. So identify your, um, identify the task. What, do, you know, what are you preparing? Um, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the task. The, t the first thing you identify is the tone, the, the tone. So is it objective or persuasive? Who's your audience? Who are you writing to? Are you writing to your supervising attorney? Are you writing to your client? Are you writing to opposing counsel? Also, if, if you're writing to your client, is your client someone that's sophisticated, like another lawyer? Is your client you know, a lay person um, you know, that doesn't have an understanding of the law? Um, so who is your audience and how do you need to tailor your tone or your voice and your writing to that person? Do you need to tailor it? What's the product? This is where you'd note, are you writing a memo, a letter, a brief, a closing argument, et cetera. Then the big thing you want to identify, hopefully you can get it from the task memo. You don't always get it from there though, is your organizing principles. And this is how are you going to do your organization of your analysis or your argument section? And then also, are there any special instructions, for example, to write a statement of facts or don't write a statement of facts, anything like that. So you wanna review the task memo and then you wanna set up your skeletal outline. You wanna set up your skeletal outline. It's usually you should do in about five minutes. So after you've got over the task memo, you immediately start typing. You immediately start putting stuff in your answer. You don't wait to do it till the end. Cause you've got to like, when it's fresh, you need to put it in. When it's fresh, you need to put it in. So you'll, you'll immediately um, put, in, put in your headings for your introduction and your analysis and conclusion. Um, you'll put in, so those I refer to as your macro headings. Um, and then also to the extent that you can, to the extent that you know the organization within your analysis or your argument section, you need to include that as well. Include that as well. So you want to get as many of your headings in there as you possibly can. And know that sometimes your headings are going to change based on, you know, what you do. But generally speaking, it doesn't if you are given the organizing principles in the task memo. Um, after that, the next thing you do, and you spend about five minutes doing this, and not everybody does this, I talk, I go into detail about whether or not to do this in the PT course, but you skim the file. And when I say skim, I mean, you literally just go through the documents. You just go through the documents and you say, um, you identify what it is. Like, what do you have? Do I have an interview with my boss? Do I have an interview with, is there an interview with me? Is there an interview with, you know, or with the client rather? Interview with the client, interview with the client's boss. Is there a newspaper article? Is there, you know, just some other client document? What all are you given within the file? You wanna just quickly take note of that. If there's anything that jumps off the page, you wanna just kind of skim through all of, all of the materials and see if anything jumps out to you. See if anything jumps out to you. So it's just a quick skim of the file, just to kind of make note of what you have. And when I say skim, I mean skim. You don't, you literally don't read it at this point. That to me, it generally is, is going to be a waste of time. Occasionally, I do have people that like to read and it, that like to actually read the, the file first. Um, that's something I address in the PT course. Um, but generally speaking, I say that just keep it to a skim. And then after that, then you actually go and you skim and you read the library. So what I mean by this is you um, is you want to first identify what do you have? Do I have one case? Do I have statutes in a case? You know, what do I have? And then you go through and you you skim if it's cases, you skim the parts of the case, and we're gonna do this until you get to the, until you start to see rules. Once you see rules, you slow down and you read from there. You're really focusing on the analysis of every case and you're assigning the cases to their respective issues. You're assigning the cases to the respective issues within your, with, within your actual answer document. Within your actual answer document, you're saying, okay, if you have three cases and you have three issues, you might make a note that you're going to use, you know, get the rules and the proof from, you know, for issue one from case one, you're going to get the rules and the proof for issue two from case two, and you're going to get the rules and the proof for issue three from case three. So you identify what you're using where, what you're using where. Then you draft your rules and you also draft what I call rule proofs. Some people also call this a case explanation. It doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. Um, so you then actually draft this is where you actually start before you even get to the file. 
before you get back to the file, you do some pretty heavy writing. You do some pretty heavy writing at this stage. So you draft those and that should take about 15 minutes. It won't take you 15 minutes if you try to do it tonight or like, you know, right now or in the next week, it's gonna take you longer. These are things that you have to practice and you have to practice and know how to do incredibly well. You have to know how to do it incredibly well to get very good at it, to get really good at it. It takes, and it does take a lot of practice. Um, I, when I was studied for the bar, I wrote eight or 10 PTs, something like that in full. And that's when we had three hour PTs. Um, so I wrote a lot of PTs or a good amount, but I had also done tons and tons and tons of really tight work on like drafting this type of stuff before the bar. And I still wasn't like really the fastest person in the world at doing it when it came, when it came to the bar. So you guys are going to watch me do this and you're going to want to be that fast. It takes a lot of practice. So um, it takes a lot of practice to be able to get it and just like know exactly what to do and how to do it. Um, um, so I'm going to show you how, and we do practice this a ton. We do practice this a lot. After that, so now you have a good chunk of your actual PT written. You have your whole, all of your headings, your subheadings, you have your rules, you have your rule proofs or case explanations, all of that is written and you're at about the 45 minute mark. So at about halfway through, you are, you are actually done with a lot of it. You're done with a lot of it. Um, and then you spend the remaining 45 minutes reading your file and actually writing the analysis and hopefully doing a little bit of proofreading. So then you go back and you read your analysis. You go back and you actually read your analysis, read, I'm sorry, you read the file, you read the file. So you read the file and you spend about 15 minutes there. And you're, as you read the file, after you've gone through the library, the significance of the facts should stand out to you. The significance of the facts should stand out to you and it should be like fairly obvious what they're getting at with the facts. Um, they should be fairly obvious what they're getting at. So that you read the file and then step seven, then you actually write your analysis and you spend about 25 minutes doing this. And this is to just write the analysis section, just write the analysis section. And you've got to make comparisons between the facts from the cases in the library and the file facts. You also have to make sure, you also have to make sure that you've actually analyzed each rule that they've given you. You have to make sure that you've analyzed every rule. Uh, and that's something that I see like, on the February 2022 PT, that's something that I saw a lot of people um, didn't do. And that's where I saw some lower scores is people, you know, gave this one was incredibly rule heavy. There was like rule after rule after rule after rule and comments and they went more in depth into the rules in the case. Um, and you needed to include all of that and you needed to actually do all of the analysis. And I just saw a lot of that lacking. So that's something when you go back and, you know, look at your PT, when you self assess your PT, like, and all of you, should go back and look at your PT um, uh, that you wrote after this session, like maybe look at it tomorrow and say, okay, well, what could, what could you have done better? Uh, what could you have done better? All right, so this is just a quick, quick review of the PT process. So now we're going to talk about actually doing it. So step one, step one, you have to review the task memo. So let me do, oops. One second, let me get my document open and let me get my PT open. And just as a side note, this document that I'm gonna show um, will be available to you um, within a couple of days after the class. So all of you should be registered for like our free workshops course um, through BarMD because that is where if you attend a live, if you attend a workshop and you've seen, or if you've seen like any of my free workshops, there's usually answers and documents that go along with the workshop, including the one tonight. Um, and all of the materials are available in the course, um, in the free workshop course. So make sure that you are registered for that. Let me just get this, do a new share, okay. Oops. All right, so you should see um, two documents on the left and on the right. You should see the PT on the left and you should see my answer. Well, you don't see my answer yet, but you should see the document with my on the right that says February 2022 performance test. So, okay. So, 
So on this, let's look at the let's look at the task memo. So this first document is called the task memo. So I'm going to read and I'm going to organize it out. You know, I'm going to read the task memo and I want to pay attention to the things that I said a minute ago. Let me do this. Yeah. All right. So I want to look for the tone. audience, what product, the organizing principle, and any special instructions. So I'm going to get my highlighter out. And obviously, you're going to do this um, you know, actually on paper, not, not on a computer. So you would just be handwriting these notes. But I type it just so that it's a little bit cleaner um, for those of you that are everybody that's watching. So Taskmo says, last December, the Superior Court dismissed an indictment charging Daryl Howe with murder. It concluded that the deputy district attorney, Mark Price, committed prosecutorial misconduct. It found that Price's dealing with Howe on October 3rd and November 18th, 2021, without the consent of Howe's counsel, violated Howe's privilege against compelled self-incrimination and his right to the assistance of counsel under the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. In dismissing the indictment, the court stated that it had initially considered, but ultimately decided against, referring the matter to the state bar to investigate whether, in his dealing with Howe on those dates, Price violated Columbia Rule of Professional Conduct Rule 4, Conduct 4.2. Um, rule 4.2, which is commonly referred to as the no contact rule, prohibits a lawyer from communicating with a person known to be represented by another lawyer without the lawyer's consent. So immediately off the bat, I see that there, I, I notice a couple of things, that there are two communications, October 3rd and November 18th. And I noticed that they give me a rule here. So rule 4.2. So uh, DA Hector Santiago has asked me to draft a proposed policy to, his to assist deputy DAs in avoiding violation of rule 4.2. As a first step, I have interviewed Price and have also interviewed Price's supervisor, senior deputy district attorney, Layla Syed. So interviewed Price. So that whenever they tell you they interviewed people, we know that we're gonna get those documents in the file. Before I begin drafting a proposed policy, I want to know whether in fact, Price violated rule 4.2 in his dealings with Howe on October 3rd and November 18th. So I, I have two factual issues to resolve. Whenever I have two factual issues to resolve, that's gonna help provide my organizational structure within my analysis section. So uh, this gives me my organizing principles. And then there might be more. To that end, please prepare a memorandum. So I'm writing a memo addressing whether Price violated rule 4.2 in his dealings with Howe on each date, including whether he could rely on Columbia Rule of Professional Conduct 5.2. So now I have for two dates, I have two rules I have to analyze. So for October 3rd, I have to analyze rule 4.2 and rule 5.2. And for November 18th, I have to analyze rule 4.2 and 5.2. So now I, I know, although I'm going to show you in a minute, what this organization looks like. And I, I think that a lot of people, it took a while to figure this out and didn't totally organize it properly. And I think that they, so people had a tough time figuring that out. And then that um, ate up time and um, it ate up time. And also if you didn't organize it well, that means that it was harder for the bar grader to see the good work that you did. So they may not see it because they're reading it too quickly. Um, so they, and they expect things to be in a particular order. They expect things to be in a particular order. Now, that being said, there's, there is more than one way to organize this PT. And I will talk about that um, in a little bit. So rule 5.2 provides that a lawyer does not violate any rule of professional conduct if the lawyer acts in accordance with the supervisor's reasonable resolution of an arguable question of professional duty. So that gives me a big rule and this rule I can see has two components. So it's gotta be a reasonable resolution and it has to be on an arguable question of professional duty. Do not include a separate statement of facts, but be sure to use the facts in your analysis. So they give us some special instructions. So what's the task? What's my task? Anybody? I'll just give you the answers. Uh, 
So, or I'm sorry, what's the tone? Is this objective or persuasive? Objective, I it's, think. Yeah, it's objective, yep. Who's the audience here? Who's the audience? When you're writing to a memo, who are you writing to? Supervisor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. What is that? That's so weird. My computer is being so weird tonight. Oh, that's fine. Okay. There, we're just going to do this. Okay. Audience is supervising attorney. What's the product I'm prepping? Memo. It's a memo. Yep. How am I going to organize? So this, I'll tell you, I'm going to organize by, by thing, organize by thing. And then underneath thing, I'm going to organize by law. So I'm going to organize by October 3rd, November 18th. And then law, then 4.2, 5.2. Often it's easier than this. Often you'll just say by event, or you'll say, by, you know, by legal issue or by client question, you'll, it, it'll, it'll often be easier, but I want to get a little bit specific in here because it's, I think people had a hard time with that. Here they say no statement of facts. No statement of facts. All right. Anybody have any questions at this point? I do. So yeah. I, I'm not super familiar with the PT. So the way I would organize just it would it be better, for example, if I had first put the, the rules and then the amount? Well, let's get into that because that's like a question for later. Let's let's get into that. I just mean, do you have any questions about the task? I'm not about any of this stuff just yet. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you guys just give me one second, my dog is crying and I'm going to let him. Just give me one second. I'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, product and, uh, organization and special instructions. So Anna asked, what is TAPOS tone, audience, product, organization, special instructions. So after that step two is to do, and these are the, um, the steps are outlined here in this document and you will be able to view this. You won't be able to print it or anything, but you will be able to view this. So we're gonna set up the PT skeletal outline. So based on, based on my looking at the task memo, I'm gonna actually type this up. So this is what I should have done. So I put in my two from date Ray, you just get this from, you just get this from the top of the memo. You get it from right here. Just basically copy it. I put in my headings for my introduction my analysis and conclusion. I put in those headings. And then I also quickly draft my introduction and my conclusion. I just quickly draft my intro and my conclusion. And your introduction is one sentence. Below, please find my analysis regarding whatever they told you to do. And that's it. You do this. I see people write massive introductions and it wastes so much time. Don't do that. Don't do that. And then I do a quick conclusion. Thank you for allowing me to conduct this analysis for you. If you have any further questions, please let me know. Please let me know. Then the thing that I want to point out here, you can kind of ignore this stuff for now. Can ignore this. Is this is how I'm going to organize it because, and I go into this and give lots of different examples of this in the actual PT course, but here they give us. Here they give us, let me just grab him so he's calm. This is Archie, just everybody. This is my puppy dog. And he doesn't like it when I'm teaching and I've been on the computer all day. Um, all right, so, um, so in our analysis section, here they give us two dates. And for each date, we have to analyze two very specific rules, rule 4.2 and rule 5.2, rule 4.2 and rule 5.2. 
So we have a date here and a date here. So whenever they give us two things like that and a date I call a thing versus rules, we want to organize by that. And you'll see this a lot. I'm trying to give you um, generic advice you can apply to other PTs. So that's why I'm explaining that in particular. And again, we do go over this tons in the PT course, but um, yeah. So, so I, this is my organization. So this is really what it should look like after you're done with step two. So 10 minutes in, I've already figured out what I've already got. It already looks kind of nice. I've got an intro and a conclusion in there. I will always add to my conclusion if I have time at the end. I'm going to add some specific answers, like a short specific answer to the questions asked. But no matter what, if you're running out of time, you don't want it to be really, really patently obvious that you're running out of time. So it's good to just have a quick intro and a quick conclusion um, you know, in here already. And you just want to have, have that stuff done so you don't have to think about it anymore. And again, like I said, at the end, should you have time, and hopefully you will, you'll add a little bit more specificity to the conclusion. But you'd, I don't ever edit the intro afterwards. Then I want to put in my sort of my like my microstructure, which is where am I going to put my rules? Where am I going to put my rule proof? What's my out like, you know, analysis and uh, conclusion paragraphs. So here, because I have rules that apply, the same rules apply to both. I'm going to probably put my rules up top. That's why it says rules and probably my rule proof potentially up here. And I'm going to have an analysis, potentially a counter argument for each rule. Analysis, counter argument. And then I have, again, for November 18th, analysis, potential counter argument. Oops, actually. And at the end of this, you should have a conclusion as to this issue. So this, can, this, this second C stands for conclusion. And then again, rule 5.2, analysis paragraph, potential counter argument, and conclusion overall. The P stands for rule proof. It's really explaining what happens in a case. You're proving up how the rule operates, how the rule operates. In law school, some legal writing professors call this a case explanation. I don't call it a rule explanation because I use that term for something else, but um, I call it a rule proof, generally speaking, because um, it's if that to me is more precise than calling something a case explanation, because it's more than just explaining what happened in a case. It's saying exactly how does that rule, you're proving how the rule works in action. Like, what does it look like? What does it look like when a court applies the rule to parties, to real life? What, what does that look like? Or here, it's not real life, but to a set of people. Um, uh, any questions so far? Other than why my dog keeps barking. No? Okay. All right. So we're done with steps one and two. We're done with steps one and two. Next, we want to skim the file. And I'm going to literally, this is what skimming the file looks like. And I, you would obviously be doing this on paper. Again, you should not. And you should have printed PTs to practice on. Do not practice them on the computer. Practice how you're going to take it. Practice how you're going to take it. So, all right, so add text. So I generally speaking, when I'm going through the PT and I'm skimming, I wanna make note of in the top right corner, that way, like when I flip really quickly, I can note what I have where. I also generally use these little plastic clips to like separate the particular documents, which if you guys have these, they look like this. They're like little plastic paper clips. And these are tiny little ones. You can see it, it's like, you know, it's like a little bit bigger than my finger now. So you use those and put them at the, you mark the beginning of each um, new document. So uh, price, interview, and I just see here, this is an interview with price, nothing really stands out. I do see like there's, and I'll kind of highlight, um, but like here's my client, here's the client kind of explaining, not my client, but price explaining what happened. And then here's a discussion with a supervisor about 4.2. And, and they, you see that the discussion is also sort of split up. Um, so September, September, they're still in September. They talked about 4.2 September. Um, 
uh, and then there's a call on October 3rd. So, so like, it's obviously organized factually, like October 3rd and then November 18th. So October 3rd, and then I, and then something happens, some stuff happens. There is um, an indictment and then there's a November 18th conversation. All right. They talk about rule 4.2. Again, so I'm just looking at it. Okay, and that's it. And then this is the interview of Layla Syed. So, oops, that text. Syed interview. Okay, and I'm just gonna scroll through this. Okay, that's no problem. Let me ask you about your discussions. Okay. Okay, so there's just, nothing is standing out. I'm literally just skimming. Do you recall speaking about the admissibility? Yeah. And then I see this, the thing that stands out, like sometimes really short sentences stand out to me. And like, you know, the no is a complete sentence here. It says, do you recall speaking with Mark about rule 4.2, the no contact rule? And like, when I looked at Bob, I was like, well, it looks like he does. He did say that they talked about it here. She says that, that they didn't talk about it. So there's a conflict in the facts. There's a conflict in the facts. And if you didn't deal with this, you were probably, you were definitely not getting a passing score on the PT. You were not getting a passing score on the PT. And she says, they'd say, you don't recall telling him. No. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Why? So they were spending a lot of time detailing this whole factual dispute. And then they talk about November 18th. No. Okay. And yeah. So then they talk about November 18th. So we can see that, that each transcript is split up based on the calls. Each transcript is, is split up based on the call. So I'm like, all right. So when it comes to it, I know that when I get to my, you know, October 3rd conversation, I'm going to use certain parts of the transcript and I will probably note, like I'll probably make a bracket around everything that's for October 3rd and be like, okay, October 3rd, a bracket around the conversations related to November 18th, just so I can find those things easily. So you I, like, I will often in my skim, I will just mark up the PT so that it, when I go back to it, it's going to be a little bit easier and I'm not spending so much time like looking for things. I kind of want to just make it so that it's a little easier for me to find things. And that's it. That's all that's in the file. So that was, that was genuinely like five minutes or less, even though I'm sitting here yammering, you know, talking about this stuff. So then I get to the library. Then I get to the library. All right. I see that I have two things. I have some rules. I have some statutes and I have one case. I have one case. It's a Supreme Columbia Supreme court case though. Um, it is a skill to parse statutes. So I tend to think that whenever there are statutes that are given, it makes it a little bit more difficult. It makes the PT a little bit more difficult. And then also when it's one case, generally they're gonna cite to a case within the case. And even if they don't, especially if they don't, you really have to like use that case and go in depth on it. So, okay. So now, and again, I'm gonna make notes about um, I'm gonna make notes about what I have here. So um, CRPC, I have the Columbia Rules Professional Conduct here. Oops. Let's see, CRPC, and I would put a little, one of my little clippies on here um, on the actual page so that it makes things easier to find. And I see here that there are a lot of rules. I see here that there's a lot of rules and I'm like, all right, so I have rule 4.2 and 5.2. I know that these are gonna be really important but I don't know what all is going to be really important quite yet. I don't know what all is going to be really important quite yet. So I'm going to read this, um, but I'm not necessarily going to type all of it into my answer just yet. I want to make note of what I have. If you have a lot of rules, generally the cases or the case is going to tell you which rules are most important. And it's going to kind of lay the rules out for you. That doesn't mean that you don't come back and read these rules and look to see what else you need to add. But you do, I, when there's a lot of rules like this, and I do consider this a lot of, not a lot of rules, a lot of statutes, like there's two full pages of statutes. That's to me, that's a lot. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to spend time parsing that just yet. So I'm going to go to the case. All right. Any questions so far? No. Okay, cool. All right, so then I have my one case. And remember, I'm gonna write in the corner what I have here. So this is State v. Nelson. So State v. Nelson, and I would have a highlighter out. So 
I always start skimming and I'm going to make a note as to what I have. I'm going to make a note and I'm going to like, actually, I actually label the paragraphs. So we grant a review in this case, it has addressed the question whether a prosecutor violates 4.2. Okay, so that's just giving me some background. So I just note it, I just label it background. Okay, and then they say here, factual background and procedural history. So I'm actually just gonna highlight that because they actually break the case down for you. And you can just kind of skim through this. You do, I don't read the facts of the cases. I don't read the facts of the cases. It takes, there's a lot of reasons, but at, you know, and you might come back and actually read the facts of the cases, but generally I don't. There's only been one instance, one PT, um, since California switched to the 90 minute PTs. So there's only been one instance where, um, where I actually like felt like I needed to go back and then it turned out that I really didn't. Um, so I just kind of skip over this um, cause, because the reason for that is, well, is twofold. One, the most important facts will be in the analysis section. So they will go through and give you the most important facts. If you can't make sense of the facts, if it feels like something's missing and you have to go back, fine, maybe. But I really want all of you to try writing, writing a rule proof, uh, explaining the case and being able to do your PT without looking at the facts of the case, because you generally really don't have to. I, I have not read the facts of this particular case. I haven't read the facts of this particular case. I think I might've like skimmed them a little bit more thoroughly, like as like a check against myself, but I actually have not read them in full um, and like in detail. So you don't generally need to because the facts that are critical, the legally significant facts will be in the analysis section of the case. Two, it is so hard to keep track of what's going on in this case that like it's hard to keep track of the parties and, and to know all, all that is going on. So um, I often find people getting really bogged down and taking too much time in the library because of that. So that's also why you really don't want to read through the facts and the procedural history of the case because it it's generally doesn't matter. It generally doesn't matter. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip this. The only thing is, is like this particular PT, there's like two pages. There are two pages of facts and th that makes me a little bit nervous. I'm not gonna lie, but you generally still, generally still doesn't matter. Generally still doesn't matter. So let's go and read any questions about that. No, okay, good. Uh, all right, so now we have the discussion section and this is where you really want to start paying attention. It's not always labeled like this for you though. It's not always labeled like this. This just happens to do it, which makes it really nice. But generally you have to go through and you have to identify where is it facts, where is it procedure? And once, it, once you get to the procedure, then generally they're gonna get into the rules and then they do the analysis. But, um, but you have to, this one, they labeled it for you. So you didn't really have to worry too much about identifying where do the rules start. So, um, so we're gonna read this and I'm gonna highlight the rules for you. I'm gonna highlight the rules for you. So the state does not dispute that if Lyons violated rule 4.2, the superior court properly dismissed the indictment against Nelson in the exercise of its supervisory power. The state claims only that Lyons did not violate rule 4.2. In support, the state argues that rule 4.2 was not intended to apply to a prosecutor. So they, so they lay out this argument and then the court gives an answer to that, which is not surprising. They say, it is, uh, they say it is too late in the day to present such an argument. Years ago, we held that, and we're just gonna get this as a rule. A prosecutor is no less subject to the Columbia rules of professional conduct than any other lawyer. I want to change the color, but that's okay. It is true that depending on the site, state v. man, and all you have to do for the site for this is to cite to man. That's it. You don't have to do any long, you know, any long sites or anything like that. And they say that in the instructions, you can just do a short site. You don't have to do page numbers or anything like that. It is true that depending on the circumstances, a prosecutor may or may not be prohibited from communicating with a defendant known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent before the defendant is indicted. One thing, and I'll, one thing that I do is when I'm highlighting rules to use, I try to omit the parts of the rule that I know aren't necessary. So it says here, it is true that depending on the circumstances, you don't need any of that. You can just say a prosecutor may or may not be 
And you don't even have to say may or may not. You could just say maybe. So a prosecutor may be prohibited from communicating with a defendant. You just need this part of the rule. Such circumstances include whether the prosecutor knows that the defendant has expressed a willingness to communicate, a fact that would militate in favor of communication, and whether the prosecutor knows that the counsel has expressed an unwillingness to consent, a fact that would militate against communication. So under 4.2, the rules of professional conduct apply to prosecutors. A prosecutor may or may not be prohibited from communicating with the defendant that's known to be represented by counsel before the defendant's indicted. So that is gonna be a question. If the prosecutor knows that the defendant wants to talk, that weighs in favor of communication. If the prosecutor knows that the party that's represented, that the lawyer doesn't want the defendant to talk, that weighs against communication. So this is a balancing test. So this can really go either way. This tells me that there's going to be ambiguity in rule 4.2. So I'm probably going to have a counter argument there and I'm going to make a note of that. So it's could go either way. So, and they may, they make, um, they italicize part of the rule before the defendant is indicted because they want to call your attention to that. The, these are all based on real cases. All of these cases are edited down by the bar examiners. And often when they italicize things in a case, it's because they're trying to draw your attention to it, the bar taker's attention to it. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was understanding how a PT is put together so that you could understand how to take it apart. So here, one of the things they're doing is they're trying to draw a distinction between pre-indictment, post-indictment. So what do you think is the difference between the October 3rd and the November 18th communications? An indictment has occurred in between. That means, that means whether Price violated 4.2 is gonna be ambiguous for the October 3rd communication, but it's not gonna be ambiguous for the November 18th communication. It's gonna be obvious, it's gonna be obvious. So it says, but it is also true that in all circumstances, and they put stuff, another thing when they, when, um, I mean, generally speaking in language, when we put things in a clause within offset commas, so a comma on either side, it's because we're drawing your attention. We're trying to make you pause. So it is also true that in all circumstances, a prosecutor is prohibited from communicating with a defendant known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent after the defendant has been indicted. So here's another rule. And I can omit again, it is also true that just in, in all circumstances. Indictment gives rise to a defendant's Sixth Amendment to rely upon counsel as a medium between him and the state. I don't necessarily need that, but I might just include it. I'm going to assume that you would because you wouldn't know to not include that. But I can tell you that you don't totally have to include that. The defendant's Sixth Amendment right would be meaningless. If one of its critical components, a lawyer-client relationship characterized by trust and confidence, could be circumvented by a prosecutor under the guise of conducting an investigation. So this is policy. This is policy. I don't know why it won't let me change the highlighter color, but that's okay. I'm going to make a note. So I always like to pay to note where there is policy. Policy is the reason for a rule. It's not a rule itself. It's the reason we have the rule. They often give you policy. And when they do, it's, it's what we call a bootstrapping argument. It's something to strengthen your argument. If there's a counter argument, if there's a counter argument to be made, I usually want to incorporate the policy. Your PTs also need to have counter arguments. I'm just going to say that out. You have to have, you have to have at least one good counter argument, ideally two, ideally two. Um, and often the policy will come in um, within your counter argument. So you so note that they break this down by argument. They 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 put this together by argument. So they say, you know, they say that, you know, argument one rules don't apply to prosecutors. They shoot that down quickly, and they say that they do apply and when they do apply and when they haven't gotten into the analysis yet. But they basically say that yes, it applies to you. The state then argues that rule 4.2 does not prohibit a prosecutor from communicating with the defendant known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent if the prosecutor is conducting an investigation. So notice they're going step by step. The way that this case is put together is designed to hint to you the things that you need to analyze, right? So if the prosecutor is conducting an investigation, so then we're gonna say, okay, under 4.2, 
under 4.2 in our instance, were they conducting an investigation? The state relies on comment H to rule 4.2, which states that which states that the rule is not intended to preclude communications with represented persons in the course of legitimate investigative activities as authorized by law. It says, well, actually, I'm not gonna highlight that because notice one thing here, notice one thing. They're saying the state, the state relies on the comment for this proposition. But we read, i.e. the court, and the court's gonna have the correct interpretation. We read comment eight to mean that, and you don't have to include all of, we read comment eight to mean that. You just highlight the actual rule. A prosecutor is not prohibited from communicating with a representative defendant if and to the extent the prosecutor is authorized by law to do so. In Columbia, a prosecutor is not authorized by law to communicate with a representative defendant where as here, the defendant has been indicted. And this is really where we start to get a little bit of analysis. I would generally use different colored highlighters, but this isn't letting me um, change my highlighter color for some reason. Oops, maybe, maybe. I don't know why, it's weird. Finally, the state next argues that even if rule 4.2 prohibits a prosecutor com from communicating with a defendant known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent, it prohibits a prosecutor, it prohibits a prosecutor only from speaking and not listening. So in just FYI, right, they're going through these things like step, you know, these are the arguments that they're making and they're dealing with each argument in turn. That means you need to deal with each of those. You need to deal with each of those. In your in in yours uh, in your answer, so um, while certainly one purpose of Rule Four Point Two is to prevent attorneys from utilizing their legal skills to gain an advantage on, uh, over an unsophisticated layperson, an equally important purpose is to protect a person by counsel not only from the approaches of his or her adversary's lawyers, but from the folly of his or uh, his or her own well-meaning initiatives and the generally unfortunate consequences of his or her ignorance. So here's more policy. So there's not really tons of analysis. Oops. Yeah. Uh, this is some more policy. And then we get to the conclusion. Because Lyons did indeed violate rule 4.2, the Superior Court properly dismissed the indictment, um, properly dismissed the indictment against Nelson in the exercise of its supervisory power. So um, um, this to me, like this part is a bit ambiguous. So what we know here is that in Nelson, is that in, an, in Nelson, the defendant had already been indicted and there was a, the only communication happened after indictment. The only communication happened after indictment. However, the court is analyzing and kind of making note of some points of ambiguity with respect to rule 4.2 with respect to rule 4.2. So this wasn't tons and tons of factual comparison. This was a lot of taking the rules, identifying what all the rules are and making sure that you analyze, analyze every single rule and analyze the strength of various arguments and how would they militate one way or the other in terms of rule 4.2. So looking at this, what I'm gonna do is I'm then gonna write my rules and I'm gonna write my rule proof. I'm gonna write my rules and my rule proof. Let's take a quick break there, just because we're at about the hour mark. Let's just take five minutes, just take a breather. And then I'm going to come back and talk about so that you can like refresh your brains a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about the rules to include here and then also drafting your rule proof. So, um, so yeah, let's take five. We'll come back at three after. So 703, I'll be right back to you. I'm going to grab some water. So, so now here we have, um, we have, our case sort of pulled apart. We have a lot of the rules highlighted, some of the analysis. So I wanna go, um, actually I wanna go back and I want to go through the, um, the statutes. Now, now that we've gone through the whole case, I'm gonna go through the statutes. So, and I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do when I read this, yeah, Archie really does hate this stuff as much as you all do. Um, we're gonna go through all these rules. Archie here. Sorry, I'm just gonna hold him while I do this. It's because I have a latte and Archie really likes 
the foam off my lattes. Like he sticks his face in my coffee cups. All right. So let's talk about parsing the statute. Now it's important when you're reading statutes is identifying, you know, what you need and what you don't. Um, so here is rule 4.2. So in representing a client, a lawyer shall not communicate directly or indirectly about the subject of the representation with the person the lawyer knows to be represented by another lawyer in the matter, unless the lawyer has the consent of the other lawyer. So that's the part of the, that's the rule that you need. That is the rule that you need. This rule shall not prohibit communications with the public board, official board, committee, or body, or communications otherwise authorized by law or court order. Then we have, um, then we have some comments and I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight the stuff that to me looks like I really need it. And there's only a little bit that I can exclude so far. It says this rule applies even though the represented person is initiates or consents to the communication. The prohibition against communicating indirectly with the person represented by counsel in paragraph A is intended to um, address situations where a lawyer seeks to communicate with a represented person through an intermediate intermediary, such as an agent, investigator, or, or the lawyer's client. So here we're just going to say I'm going to highlight that it's really this comment. I'm just like you can't do it as an agent either, agent or an investigator. It's just that's that's about it. I know I know this. I don't think I need to actually type this whole thing in. One of the things that you have to figure out as you're going through this is what are all the rules that you need to type in and what can you omit? Because there's a lot in here. There's a lot. So paragraph C2 recognizes that statutory schemes, case law, and court authorized court orders may authorize communications between a lawyer and a person that would otherwise be subject to this rule. The law recognizes that prosecutors and other government lawyers are authorized to contact represented persons either directly or through investigative agents and informants in the context of investigative activities as limited by relevant, uh, by relevant federal and state constitution, statutes, rules, and case law. So the part of this that's important here is talking about prosecutors. The guy, the guy that we're talking about is a prosecutor. Is a prosecutor. So prosecutors can do this in the context of investigative activities as limited by law. Okay, now he wants to know. Uh, this rule is, the rule is not intended to preclude communications with represented persons in the course of such legitimate activities as authorized by law. All right, it doesn't really add anything. I actually wanna point something out to you all. So this part, this is, um, you need all of this as limited by relevant law. You can omit all of this that I didn't highlight. So one thing that I do when I'm reading, when I'm reading the law, when I'm reading the rules is I'm trying to identify which parts of the sentence do I need to include and which parts do I not need. That is, um, that is helpful because when I'm just going through, um, I want to make sure that I'm not typing in too much. I'm not going to waste time typing in stuff that's unnecessary. And that is a skill that also takes time. The skill that takes time. And then we have rule 5.2. So responsibilities of a subordinate lawyer. A lawyer shall comply with these rules, notwithstanding the lawyer acts at the direction of another lawyer or other person. A subordinate lawyer does not violate these rules if the lawyer acts in accordance with the supervisor's supervisory lawyer's reasonable resolution with, and I like to sometimes break up my highlights to sort of show that there are various elements. So a supervisor lawyer is reasonable resolution of an arguable question of professional duty. Um, and then we have a comment here. So when lawyers in a supervisor subordinate relationship encounter a matter involving professional judgment as to the lawyer's responsibility under these rules. So when you encounter a matter involving professional judgment under these rules, and that tells us that that's another element. So and the question, so I like to often, um, when I notice that there are elements, I like to number this. So one, so uh, one professional judgment. Um, oh, let's see. And the question can reasonably be answered only one way. The duty of both lawyers is clear and they are equally responsible. Accordingly, the subordinate lawyer must comply with his or, his or her obligations under paragraph A. 
if the question can reasonably answer in more than one way, the supervisory lawyer may assume responsibility for determining which of the reasonable alternatives to select and the subordinate may be guided accordingly. So uh, text two, if can be resolved more than one way, then not liable, which they basically told us in the task memo this rule, but I just like to make note. All right. All right, so then after I've gone through and sort of parsed these rules now, and remember, you could just spend 15 minutes reading the library. I was reading it out loud, making notes, explaining decisions, et cetera, and I don't think I spent a total of more than 15 minutes doing that. It's only been, even with a five minute break, we've only been in here for about 60 minutes total um, in, in this PT workshop. So then I would go back. So on this stage, the reason I put my notes in here is I put my R for where my rules are gonna go, for my rules are gonna go. And this is just for this particular PT. Other PTs I organize a different way. So you don't always do it like this, but PTs where you have rules that apply to all of the analysis go up above the, the actual analysis. And then I have my proof, which is gonna be explaining what happened in Nelson, explaining what happened in Nelson. So, I'm gonna make, so my notes, my rules are all gonna be, you know, 4.2, 5.2, and then Nelson. And then my proof is gonna be of Nelson. Often, um, you know, I have a, a rule and a proof under various legal issues, but here we don't have to do that. So you're just, you're just including them up here. You're just including them up here. So you would make note of this when you're skimming and, you know, reading the case. All right, and then I'm gonna actually, oh, so here it is. Uh, here's my, my rules, oh, and Nelson. So after, after step four, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what, so I, I keep the same, you know, it's the same macro heading. All I've added is that what I'm using, you know, where I'm gonna include all of my rules and where, what I'm using for my rule proof for each issue. This will vary and you can watch my other videos or we go over like nine or 10, we go over like, nine-ish PTs in the PT course, plus there's additional ones that, that we don't go over live but that you have access to. Um, we go over a lot, all of the various ways to set up different PTs. Um, sometimes though, you'll have a rule and a proof like under a particular heading, because they might be, if there's different rules for this issue than this one, you're gonna have the appropriate rules under each particular heading. So then I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna include my rules. So this is incredibly rule heavy. This is incredibly rule heavy. So I've got all my rules and I'm not gonna go through, you know, writing all my rules and selecting those, but this is incredibly rule heavy. Uh, I will explain the A and the C, I will explain that. So this is incredibly rule heavy. So I put in all of the rules. I put in all of the rules that apply into this, into a single paragraph. You might break it up a little bit like this. You could um, break up though. So rule 4.2 here and then rule 5.2 here. That would be totally fine too. That would be totally fine. And then I'm gonna put, I'm gonna draft my rule proof. So rule proofs, I put the formula in the handout at the top, but it's just in case name, the court held holding because facts and reasoning. And I go into, like in the course, I like have you all, I will have you write these during class. You'll send it to me as a DM. I'll give you feedback, et cetera. So um, um, this, you know, it takes a lot of practice to get good at. It takes a lot of practice to get good at and it takes a lot of practice to, go, to get um, proficient in doing it quickly, which is important for the PT because a PT is a racehorse every single time, no matter what. So in this particular PT, in this particular PT, there wasn't a whole lot of actual discussion of the facts because they just said, look, it happened after indictment. So my PT really focused on all of the reasonings, all of the various arguments that were made, all of the various arguments that were made. So in Nelson, the court held, right? So we have in Nelson, which is, let me do this. In Nelson, the court held, then we have the holding and the holding, the prosecutor violated rule 4.2. 
because, and this is all the facts and reasoning. So facts and reasoning. I'm not gonna highlight all of it because then it would be like hard to look at. So the court held, and I go through the case, I go through the case and I'm like, all right. So in this one, what did they do in the case? They spent, they went through basically three arguments in turn. So I said that the court, the court held the pros, that held that the prosecutor violated 4.2 because she spoke to her criminal defendant after the defendant had been indicted. They, they focused on that. Despite a co-defendant's attorney having initiated, oh, I did actually go back in the facts with this, but you don't have to. Um, so the, um, let me see, after the yeah. So after the defendant had been indicted, despite a co-defendant's attorney, let's see. Oh, yeah. So despite a co-defendant's attorney having initiated the contact with the prosecutor because the criminal defendant's attorney did not consent to the communication, prosecutors are subject to 4.2 and it applies even if the prosecutor is conducting an investigation because allowing a prosecutor to circumvent the rule via an investigation would erode the Sixth Amendment protection and that rule 4.2 bars a prosecutor from communicating, which includes both speaking and listening because 4.2 intends equally to prevent attorneys from utilizing their legal skills to gain an advantage over an unsophisticated layperson and to protect a person represented by counsel from the folly of his or her own well-meaning initiatives and the general unfortunate consequences of his or her own ignorance. So I just said the prosecutor violated 4.2 because the reasons they gave, they buy it because it was post-indictment. It was post-indictment. They, they argued that it doesn't apply to prosecutors. The court said, yes, it does. It applies to you here. Um, um, they said that it was because it was an investigation. They said it doesn't matter because um, they just said that it's, um, uh, they said that the prosecutor was um, not prohibited from communicating with the defendant if and to the extent the prosecutor is authorized by law to do so, including an investigation. They said even if it's for an, if it's for an investigation, if it's post indictment, that doesn't matter. So I included that reason. So I was looking for all of the arguments and all of the reasons the court all of the responses the court made to that argument. And then finally, they say that um, if the speaking from listening, and so I included the rule that they said it doesn't matter, that even if you're just listening, that can still amount to a violation. That could still amount to a violation. So, um, oh, did I? Oops, I, all right. So I put my rules and my rule proof in here. So I drafted that. For those of you that haven't like taken the course, this is something we spend tons and tons of time doing and you guys practice it quite a bit, but you'll have the answer. You will have the answer to this um, available to you. Um, so you can look at, so you can look at that. But the interesting thing about this PT um, and this, the interesting about this PT and, and this does happen in cases, this is you know where we say the court held whatever the holding is because facts and reasoning you have to look, you have to incorporate, well, what did the court reason in coming to its conclusion? Often that's going to include looking at what the court, um, what the court, um, or what the opposing side argued or the losing side argued and why that argument failed or why, you know, why the party that won, won, like what are the reasons that they bought? So you have to do that quite a bit. So that's what this rule proof is, is doing. Any questions? And somebody had a question earlier about um, about the organization. So if you wanted to ask that now, that would be good. Um, yeah, Lita. Um, so I have a question on your, can you scroll down just a tad on your, yeah, right there, okay. So you put this huge like rule statement and then your rule proof now where it says A, whether Price violated the rules of professional conduct on October 3rd, then you have rule 4.2. Are you gonna again repeat that? No, no, no. This is analysis. This is just an, I shouldn't have had it there. This is analysis, counter argument and analysis and counter argument there. No, this is just the analysis. I'm just saying this is my analysis of rule 4.2 and this is my analysis of rule 5.2. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I get it now. Cause I was like, why would you repeat that again? No, no, no. You definitely don't repeat that. That would be a big waste of time. Okay. That's and then my second question is, cause I was, because you're kind, you're finished with the product, right? With your paper. No, I'm not finished yet. No. Oh, okay. Then I just I'll had wait. some stuff in there that I didn't delete, so I just that's why I just cleaned it up a little bit. Okay, I'll wait. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get to the analysis. Yeah, Yolanda, did you have a question too? Yes, Mauri. Thank you. So my question is: there is any um, 
a structure similar to Iraq or Kriak or something like that that we have you we should use for this PT? It's Kerpak or Kriak, yeah. Kriak. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um so um, Anna, uh, you asked, I said, do not read the facts. I mean the facts from the library, like the facts from the cases in the library. So like this whole section, which I did go back and read a little bit of, cause I wanted to just to double check. Um, and you didn't need to, you didn't need to read them at all. You didn't need to read them at all. And in fact, they're really confusing. That like threw me off. So you don't need to, you don't need them. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So the next thing you're going to do, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to go back and you're going to read the file. You're going to read the file. So let me scroll back up and you're actually going to read it now. And I'm not going to go through and write the whole analysis for this. Um, I have written it and you all can read it um, in. Yeah, you all can read it in the course. We do go through and like actually write a bit more. Um, but this is just, you guys have all written this before. Um, so yeah, so so here we would actually read it. Let me just read this with you all um, and I wanna point some things out. So Deborah, you know, thanks for sitting for an interview. Of course, we wouldn't be going to the next side of Adam Botch the case. Unfortunately, you're not the first deputy to get an indictment dismissed. I'm meeting with you because, and I'm just gonna read this quickly. In dismissing the indictment, Judge Gorant said she had initially considered referring to the matter to the state bar to investigate whether you violated 4.2 but ultimately decided not to because this was your first offense in a long career. I'm meeting with you as a first step in drafting a proposed policy to assist deputy DAs in avoiding violation of rule 4.2. I understand, I'm sorry I put the you in the office in this position. That's okay, let's get on with it. I see you brought up the chronology of events. Why don't you summarize what happened? It's usually when there's an interview like this and an interview transcript is there's gonna be a bunch of nonsense for like the first half or third of the page and then they're gonna get into the details. So I usually am like, all right, you know, he says, here we go. And then they're going to give us a large, like, kind of factual summary of what happened. And that's exactly what they do here. This is very typical. So as you know, on August 21st, 2021, Billy Wilson was shot and killed in an apartment house here in Millbrook. Within hours, Daryl Howe was arrested for Wilson's murder. Howe admitted to being at, admitted being at the scene of the murder, but claimed he didn't do it. On August 24th, Howe was arraigned in the Superior Court before Judge Gorentz. I appeared for the state. Deputy Public Defender James Gardner was appointed to represent Howe. So I know that he was represented by counsel. Oh, appointed to represent Howe. And Howe was ordered held without bond until a preliminary hearing could be held. Okay. On September 6th, I moved Judge Gorens to release Howe on his own recognizance pending further investigation of the case. So pending in further investigation. So now we're going to have some investigation. So now I'm like, oh, that's why they were talking about the whole investigation thing because there's an investigation here, obviously. Prior to Howe's release, I told Deputy Defendant Gardner that I would like to speak with Howe about the case. He said he would consent only if I was willing to offer Howe complete immunity, which of course I was not. So now we know that there is no consent and you wanna make notes as you read this. So add text. So um, he is represented by counsel. Sometimes I like, I often like to, um, uh, I often like to, if you guys have messages that are very specific, please don't send it to me. Please send them to Noelle, um, cause I'm not going to be able to respond. Um, or just put them to the whole group and we are send them to Noelle and then I can try to, we can answer at the end of class. So next thing here, I told deputy defender Gardner that I would like to speak to him. He said he would only consent. So council does not consent to um, D speaking with Price. Okay. On September 26, Howe called the office of Millbrook Police Detective Donna Daichi from his home um, and left a voicemail message saying he wanted to talk to her about the Wilson murder. So, so one, we're in an investigation, right? We're in an investigation. Two, the defendant initiated contact. So, so D initiated contact um, with detective. So with detective, so agent of prosecutor, agent of price. Okay. 
I had no personal. Okay. So detective Daichi, I don't know how you say that. Daichi, Daichi, I don't know. Immediately told me about the message. I had no personal experience with the defendant who contacted the police to talk about his own case. So he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. So I consulted. So now we go to consulting with um, supervising lawyers. So I'm going to say here, rule, I'm going to say R5.2. So here's some facts for rule 5.2. Here's some facts for rule 5.2. She advised me that statements how my volunteer would likely be admissible. She also advised me to instruct Detective Daichi. So I'm going to highlight some of the important facts here as I go. And you might use different color highlighters, although I just, for some reason, it's not letting me change the color of my highlighting. It usually does. So who, as you know, is my supervisor as the chief of the felony section. She advised me that any statements would likely be admissible. She also advised me to instruct Detective Daichi that if Howe were to call her, she should listen, but not ask any questions. So I'm like, all right, I know that they said that they don't like them. You know, they don't like the prosecution or, or prosecutors to speak with um, criminal defendants. But this is, if it's pre-indictment, pre if it's pre-indictment, then, um, then you may be able to, if it's within the context of an investigation. And I think, well, it's, if you're allowed to do it, if you're allowed to do it, and that's maybe questionable, if you're allowed to do it, listening is still gonna be better than directly asking questions. So I think there's gonna be a little bit of a counter argument there. Gave the instruction to Detective Daichi. Mark, did you have any discussion with Layla about Rule 4.2? Okay, now we're getting into Rule 4.2. Now we're getting into Rule 4.2. Price, yes. I don't remember whether I raised the issue or whether Layla did, but I'm sure she told me. I'm sure she told me Rule 4.2 permitted prosecutors to communicate with defendants known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent so long as they're conducting an investigation. Now, this sounds broadly, this sounds broadly that you're allowed to communicate so long as they are, um, so long as you're conducting an investigation. It doesn't mention pre-indictment, post-indictment. So Nelson does, Nelson does. So even if this were true, even if this were true, we know that 5.2 only applies on an arguable question of law. So even if this was the exact advice that he was given, you can't do it post-indictment because that's not an arguable question of law. It's not an arguable question. Okay, did Howe call Detective um, Daichi after September 26th? Yes, he called her from his home on October 23rd. So here we have October 3rd phone call. He made several statements to her about the Wilson murder. As I instructed her, she listened but did not ask any questions um, and reported to me what he said. So that's that. And then and then on October 5th, Judge Gorens conducted a preliminary hearing, found probable cause to charge Howe with the Wilson murder and remanded him to custody and ordered him held without bond. Um, at the preliminary hearing, Deputy Public Defender Gardner learned of the events of October 3rd and asked Judge Gorens to order Detective Daichi to, to not to speak with Howe. So the public defender learns of the events and then asks the judge to order the detective not to speak with Howe. Judge Gorenz declines to do so. So the fact that the judge declined tends to indicate that this was actually okay conduct, but observed that Gardner would undoubtedly instruct how that such dealings were not in his best interest. So now he's been instructed that, that not to do this, that like you really shouldn't be doing that, you know, and telling the criminal defendant. Then we have October 19th, the grand jury handed up the indictment charging Howe with the Wilson murder. So here is the indictment. Then about a month later on November 18th, while Daichi was in my office working with me on the Wilson murder case, I received a collect call from Howe, um, from, Howe from the jail on my private line. I accepted the call. I hadn't given Howe my number. He must've gotten it from Daichi. At my request, Daichi listened in on an extension. Although I advised Hal that he did not have to speak with me. Now this is post indictment. This should not be happening. This should not be happening. Um, although I advised Hal that he did not have to speak with me and that Deputy Public Defender Gardner would not be happy if he did, he nevertheless proceeded to talk about the Wilson murder for about 20 minutes while Daichi and I listened and took notes. Um, so hadn't given him his number. 
He must have gotten it from the detectives or from the, yeah. Also the detective listens in. So advised how they did not have to speak with me that this lawyer wouldn't be happy, but they still do. And they just listen, they just listen. So, all right. So this tells me, I'm like, well, maybe there's an argument that, you know, that he advised, he advised the defendant. Well, you don't have to talk to me. Your lawyer doesn't want you to like, et cetera. But, but at this point it's post indictment. He cannot be communicating. He can't be communicating. Any further discussion with Layla about rule 4.2 around November 18th, probably the same as before that rule 4.2 permitted prosecutors conducting an investigation with defendants known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent. And then finally, as you know, Judge Gorentz held a hearing at the request of Deputy Public Defender Gardner. By this time, Gardner learned of the events of November 18th. Gardner moved to dismiss the indictment for what he claimed was prosecutorial misconduct. Unfortunately, Judge Gorentz granted the motion and the rest is history. All right, yes, Mark, sad to say it is. You've given me a good, good introduction. If I need to follow up, I'll let you know. Fine, again, I'm sorry about all of this. I understand we've gotta be more careful in the future. Okay, so tons and tons of tons in here, right? I personally don't take tons of notes and like I, I'd mark up my file, but I don't start typing stuff into my actual document yet. I find that that wastes too much time. I have had bar takers do that and find that it is helpful. That's something that like we, I usually talk about people like in the, you know, usually talk with people about that in the class about what's right for them. Um, all right, now we have the Syed interview. Now we have the Syed interview. Layla, thanks for coming in for an interview about the Howe case. No problem. You've had a chance to review. So I always read these. There's always going to be some like niceties at the beginning. RG wants to say hi. There's some niceties here. You've had a chance to review any materials you might uh, believe are relevant. Yes, but I must add that there were few such materials in the felony section. We don't have much time to commit anything to paper. Um, all right, I understand. Let me cut to the chase and ask you about your discussions. Okay, ready when you are. Do you recall Mark consulting you on September 26th of last year after Howe had contacted Millbrook Police Detective Donna Daichi and had made statements to her about the Wilson murder? Yes, although I can't swear we spoke on September 26th, I remember we spoke to, about Howe's statements to Detective Daichi. Do you recall Mark telling you something to the effect that he had no personal experience with the defendant who contacted the police to discuss his own case? Yes. Do you recall speaking with Mark about the admissibility of any statements Howe might make to Detective Daichi? Yes. I probably told him that any statements how my volunteer would likely be admissible. I'm not highlighting anything, highlighting anything because there's nothing new here. This is all just like reiterating what we already know. Um, all right. Yes, I probably told Mark to, to tell Detective Daichi to listen to how if he contacted her again, but not to ask him any questions and to report to Mark what Howe said. Why? To make sure any statements would be admissible. Do you recall speaking with Mark about rule 4.2, the no contact rule? No. You don't recall telling him that the no contact rule or rule 4.2 permitted prosecutors to communicate with defendants known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent, so long as they're conducting an investigation? No, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. So this goes back to those instructions. There is a direct conflict in the facts here. And remember that you have to identify the conflicts and identify how you're gonna resolve it or what other information you need. And also identify, you should also identify how you can get that information. Why? So why are you sure that you didn't say that? Deborah? you know that we have to refer any non-trivial question about professional conduct to senior deputy district attorney, Lamar Lewis, the compliance officer. And dealing with a defendant who is known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent is certainly a non-trivial question. Had Mark raised any question about the no contact rule with me, I would have referred it to Lamar. I didn't refer it to Lamar. That means Mark didn't raise it with me. Let's proceed to November 18th. Do you, recall Mark, do you recall Mark consulting you around that date for a second time about how in his statements to Mark as well as Detective Daiichi? No. After speaking with Mark in September about how in his statements to Detective Daiichi, I did not speak with him about the matter again, at least not before Judge Gorence dismissed the indictment. So he's, now we see like another conflict. There's actually two conflicts. This one doesn't matter so much though, but, but she says that, um, that she didn't speak with him a second time. So this is actually a second factual discrepancy. This one though, I really don't think is that big of a deal. Um, a perfect answer would address it, but the bigger conflict is that I didn't refer this up. I didn't give him any advice as to what to do for 4.2. That's critical because 5.2 can only save you if four point, um, um, if you got the, if you got the advice. 
So, um, so no, after speaking with Marcus September about how in a statement to Detective Daichi, I did not speak with him about the matter again, at least not before Judge Gorns dismissed the indictment. After Judge Gorns dismissed the indictment, as I believe you know, I had a long and unpleasant discussion with Mark about the matter. Yes, I know about the discussion, but you're sure you don't recall a second consultation on or around, around November 18th? I'm sure. In my 20 years in the office, I've never heard of a defendant contacting a deputy DA. Had Mark told me that Hal contacted him, I would have immediately referred the matter to Lamar Lewis. Again, we see Lamar Lewis. They're saying this other person's name twice because they want you to say, this is who you get the information from. Lamar Lewis has the information that's, that's conflicting that we need. He can solve this. And I certainly would have remembered it. Oh, well, maybe not. Well, Lily, you've answered the questions I have now. If more occur to me, I'll let you know. Thanks. So I just wanted to show you, I wanted to show you how we sort of pull apart the file, recognize the significance, you know, how, what, how they put, um, draw attention to particular things, how they organize discussions, et cetera. So then, then I would go in and you, and also where are the ambiguities for um, counter arguments? So first, and I'm just gonna walk you through this. I'm gonna walk you just kind of briefly through this. So first I say, just as a preliminary matter, Price is subject to the rules of professional conduct. That's one of the arguments that they made in Nelson. So I wanna make sure that I analyze that. So I just deal with that at the outset. That's really easy, that's really obvious. And then with respect to October 3rd, I analyze rule 4.2. Um, so, um, I, so I talked about, I went through you know, each rule basically in turn and said how rule 4.2 bars all communications. Um, uh, let's see, um, that, that the detective, an agent of the prosecution spoke with Howe, despite knowing that Howe was represented by counsel and that they lacked consent. So I'm really just getting to rule 4.2. Um, um, so, okay, the prosecutor, they lacked consent, but that this doesn't necessarily amount to a violation of rule 4.2 because the communication was before indictment. So I, I just like the court in Nelson placed emphasis on the fact that it was before indictment. I, I lay that out to you. Um, so 4.2 does allow a prosecutor to speak with a represented person in some circumstances, including when, uh, when the accused initiates the communication. So I said, see rule 4.2 in Nelson here, how initiated the contact with Detective Daichi. Additionally, the communication was in context of an investigation. So I say that, you know, that the, de that the defendant contacted the detective. The communication was in the context of an investigation into whether how actually committed the, er the murder at issue as authorized by 4.2 comment three. And the detective merely listened rather than asking question. And th then here is a counter argument, which should be in a separate paragraph. And I like to start it with although. Um, so I have my counter argument. Although listening can be just as problematic as questioning, which suggests it does violate rule 4.2, uh, this argument is unpersuasive because it can still be viewed as a softer approach when the detective was permitted to ask questions at that stage. Moreover, the judge refused to order the detective not to speak with defendant, which indicates to the prosecution that their conduct was permissible. And then rule 5.2. Additionally, even if, even if, so I'm giving an alternative argument, even if Price violated rule 4.2, Price might be able to rely on for rule 5.2. So first, and then, then I'm going through each of the components of, of 5.2. Price is a subordinate lawyer because he had no experience regarding what to do when a criminal defendant contacted the police to talk about the defendant's case. And Parks, uh, Price spoke with the supervising attorney, Layla Sayed, regarding the issue. Price may be able to rely on for Rule 5.2 as a defense because Price allegedly contacted a supervising attorney who instructed him that 4.2 permitted prosecutors to communicate with defendants known to be represented by counsel without counsel's consent, so long as they're conducting an investigation. Um, the question of whether the October 3rd phone call uh, violated 4.2 is an arguable question of professional duty because the rules indicate an attorney may be able, and I would put this in quotes probably, to speak with a represented entity in some instances before indictment. Additionally, Price's supervising attorney allegedly instructed um, Price that Detective Daichi could listen and that doing so would not be considered communicating for the purposes of Rule 4.2. Um, okay. 
Okay. And then I have another little paragraph dealing with the facts, the factual dispute. Price's supervising attorney, Lila Sayed, disputes this conversation happened. So it would be critical to interview senior deputy district attorney, Lamar Lewis, the compliance officer, to verify whether Price's or Sayed's versions of events is true. Thus, and I would probably say so long as Price's version of events is true, Price likely did not violate 4.2 in his dealings with Howe on October 3rd. However, he may be able to rely on rule 5.2, even if he did, but we would need to speak with Lamar Lewis to verify whose recollection is accurate. So I, and in the class, I get into like really writing analysis, um, but this is my analysis. Here's an analysis paragraph. Um, here's a counter argument paragraph. And then I go into rule 5.2. So here's my analysis of 5.2. Um, here's the factual issue, factual issue. And you might even like, you might even um, lay this out, just be like factual discrepancy. I would never do that in real life, but on the bar, like in practice, but on the bar, I might do it just to call attention to the grader that I saw that, but you don't have to do that. It's just something you could do. Um, and then I have my conclusion. Here's counter argument. So this, the last C is always counter argument and any like C before that is a counter argument. Or I'm sorry, the last C is a conclusion. A C before that is a counter argument. And then again, and then I have November 18th. And I say um, here, this is very simple. Here, how was indicted on October 19th or was it 9th? I don't remember. Which means he had already been indicted as of the November 18th communication. Thus, Price was barred from communicating with Howe from that date, even if it was in the course of an investigation and even if Howe initiated the contact. See Nelson. And then I have a counter argument here. Although Detective Daichi informed Howe that he did not have to speak with him, which suggests the communication on November 18th was permitted, this argument is unpersuasive because the court and Nelson explained that post indictment communication is absolutely barred, even if the attorney merely listens. Thus, he violated 4.2. And then I said, I explained why 5.2 doesn't save him here. And then I add my, I add a little bit of detail to the conclusion here. And I just want to point this out. My answer is only 1,277 words. This is not incredibly long, not incredibly long. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit longer than that because I added a little bit as we were sitting here, but, um, but this, this is not incredibly long. A lot of people tell me that they run out of time, that they just don't type fast enough. Um, how many minutes is it now? 1303. Um, but if you, um, generally speaking, if you spend the amount of time typing that I tell you to spend here, which is around 45 minutes, it's around 45 minutes, even if you're not a super fast typer, which is like 40 words a minute, um, that will get you to 1600 words. So I don't, you don't even have to be like a 40 word a minute typer, which is like, that's average, that's average. So it's really about, the time management and like knowing how to extract things from a case, knowing how to write analysis, knowing how to extract your rules, knowing how to pull, how to deconstruct the case in the library. All right. Any questions, which I'm sure there are plenty. When would uh, this be made available, the document? Uh, within about two days, we have to let the video process. And Noelle, let me, I sent it to you earlier. Noelle, let me just send it with a couple of little edits that I made. I'm going to send it to her right now and she'll get it posted. Any other questions? Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Ashley. Um, hi, yeah, I have a question. So I've heard a lot of a, a, a concept called analogizing. I'm not like familiar how, how to, I didn't see it in your answer. I don't know. I did do it. It was, it was required to do it every it's time. Always, always, always required. You're going to compare, you're going to compare analogizing or distinguishing as comparing the facts of our case to the facts of the case in the library. Here, I was analogizing one to the fact that it was, um, that in, in Nelson, the, all the communications were post indictment, so you couldn't do it. So I'm like, you know, just like in, just like the prosecution in, in 
Nelson communicated post indictment and it was barred. It was a violation here. It was the November 18th conversation was post indictment and is therefore barred. Two, I, the other thing that I analogized was all of the arguments that were made, all of the reasons that they gave. So that was the analogizing. So I was looking at the arguments and using that to um, analogizing those arguments to my case and, and how it would um, impact, how it would impact the case. Often other PTs, there's a lot more. There's a lot more facts. Um, this one was kind of unique in that there weren't as many facts, but you can analogize with the reasoning as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so somebody asked um, in the chat if I can tell you about the PT course. Yeah, so the PT course is um, five classes. They're each about three hours. It starts on June 7th. Um, it starts on June 7th. And in the class, we start by doing sort of like this, but with an easier, I do a different PT. And I walk you through step by step how to do it. And we will dig in a little bit deeper. Um, I'm going to talk about writing analysis. I'm going to show you how to deconstruct a case. I'm going to talk more about analogizing to the facts of the cases, et cetera. So the very first class is really about going through the approach. And I'm focusing on that. I'm really focusing on the approach. I'm talking about really extracting rules. I will have all of you do some practice extracting rules, et cetera. PT uh, class two, we cover objective PTs. We generally will cover two PTs. We'll generally cover two PTs in that class. And again, in that class, like I'm gonna have you all, and the thing that's really nice about the class too is that we, I do have you all write lots of stuff. Like I will have you write a poor, I'll say like, all right, how do you extract the rules? And I'll, I'll do part of it on the PT and then I'll have you all do part of it on another section. And I'll have you DM the rules. Um, I'll have you DM the rules to me. And so I can give you feedback on what, on what you wrote. And then, and we'll also have you practice drafting rule proofs. I do that in the sec, in the, in the objective class too. So I have you practice writing those and I give you feedback on doing that. I give you formulas for doing that stuff. Um, in the third class, we talk about, um, in the third class, we talk all about persuasive PT. So I'm getting more into how, you know, the various tasks that are persuasive, like an objective, I talk about the, the various tasks. So like a letter to a client and a memo, setting it up, the language you use for the headings for an objective PT. For persuasive, we talk about the language you use for the headings for a persuasive PT. I talk about the organization. I give you, I also give you templates for all of the like various PT types. So I give you that. Um, uh, we talk about counter arguments generally in the persuasive class, even though you have to do it in objective ones too. Like every class is building on the last. So like we're focused, it's they're very skills focused. But I want to make sure that like before I teach you how to write counter arguments, I want to make sure you know how to write analysis. Um, um, so um, yeah. Um, the and then in um, one so in the fourth class we cover like other tasks. So like drafting a closing argument. What if they give you something really crazy like tell you to draft a will? We look at all of these various things, and I show you all of the other types of tasks. And I show you just like some of the more difficult PTs, like how do you figure out the more difficult tasks? So we look at like oddball or like other types of tasks and difficult tasks in the fourth class. And then the fifth class is what I call, um, the fifth class is what I call PT drills. And that class is really hands-on. So all of you guys, I give you 30 minutes and I tell you to figure out the organization of a PT and draft your rules and your rule proofs. I tell you to draft your rules and your rule proofs. Um, usually I give you like 20 minutes and just figure out like and write out the structure, et cetera. Um, and then ideally you will be able to like also some of you will get through writing some of the rules in the PTs. Um, but we do this thing called drills. And I actually teach you the drills early on too, just so you can practice getting the organization because that seems to be for a lot of people where they get hung up. For a lot of people, it's figuring out, okay, well, my like like the organization I did for this one for like, you know, the October 3rd phone call and the November 18th. And then under each of those doing the various rules. Um, so, so we do, I teach you all how to do that. And I give you tons of examples for that stuff too. Um, you have access to all the PTs and the recordings um, um, via until the bar. So until, until and through the bar, um, if you don't, if for some reason you don't pass the class, you can, or if you don't pass the bar, 
you do get to rejoin the class for free the next time. So you definitely get to do that too. And th the nice thing is getting the, um, I really like the, the classes this way. And I like doing them via Zoom because you can get that. I can, I can literally have like 30 people send me their answers and I like run through and they're like, yep, yep, nope. It's like very obvious. It's very easy to do that, which is great. Um, I do have, um, I do have a California version of this course and a UBE specific version. So if you're, if you're taking the California bar, you sign up, like the, the course website is the page is the same, but there's a drop down menu. If you want to take the UBE version, that's on Tuesday nights. And I think it starts June. When does it start? Noelle, can you put the dates? Um, can you put the dates in for the, uh, yeah. So yeah, so we have, it might be, it might start June 8th, but it might start the week. I don't recall. I'd have to look. Um, cause my, I have like stuff I teach every night of the week almost. Um, so yeah, so I do have both options for those. Um, yeah. So those are the courses. Um, and also just so you know, too, I do have a version of like, I have a workshop series for courses for the essays. Um, I have an essay workshop too. I'm doing a free sample of it um, on Wednesday. So definitely come to that if you can. Um, the PT course is $4.99. Um, so it's like 500 bucks. And if you want, you can split it up into two payments. And it's just like automatically, you can do that on the website. So you can split it into two payments of $2.49. So we try to make it really easy to do that. Um, and if you have any other questions about the course, you know, you can ask them now. Um, yeah, and yes, if you don't pass, you can join the next one for free, same for the essay workshops. Um, Lucene, which one is it? I think it's State v. Martin, where there's one case in the library where I thought you needed to read it at the initially, but then you really didn't. You needed to read the file, the, the facts in the case. You needed to read the fact. You always have to read the file. And I go in this stuff, I go way in depth into this stuff. Um, in the, in the classes, like I go very detailed and answer questions and, you know, stay on if people have specific questions, et cetera. So I try to like, you know, I want you all to pass this and like the PT, I do go in and break these things down step-by-step. Step. I go very slowly tonight. I, I was going through so much material, but we'll go through, um, you know, we break that, we break it down, really break it down. And you always don't start to get the process and we're able to go through things faster and faster. So, yeah. So in the class, you know, we slow it down a little bit and we give you, I, I do give you examples. I, yeah, I give you templates. I give you formulas for writing your analysis, for writing your counter arguments. I gave you the proof, real proof formula, but it really is just like plug and play. But on top of that, um, on top of that, I do give you, um, you, know, you get a lot of practice and feedback. The classes are three hours each. The classes are three hours each. And they're from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, for a California PT, it's 6 to 9 p.m. California time. And for the PT, for the UBE, so for the MPT, um, um, for, the, for the UBE, it's on Tuesday evenings, I think. And those are from 6 to 9 Eastern time. Um, Juliet, it depends. Um, no, this was an objective PT. This was an objective PT. You just have to answer it. I wasn't trying to convince you. I was just giving you my objective analysis. Um, and Juliet, it sort of depends. Like, it's not tutoring, right? But like, sometimes people just ask me like a random question here and there. Um, and that I'm fine with. But if it gets to like really detailed and a lot, then that turns to tutoring and that's a different thing. Um, and Noelle, can you post the dates in the chat for both um, for both the, the UBE and for the California. Um, I, don't, I don't grade your PTs. Grading is separate. Grading is separate. But you do get feedback in class. You do get feedback in class. And a lot of people don't need it after. Um, a lot of people don't need as much like tutoring and stuff because the PT class is so instructive and you do get a lot of practice. Thanks, Anthony. Anybody have any other questions? All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming. I know that, you know, it's a Sunday evening, a couple of hours, it's kind of a lot. So thanks for coming. Um, we will email the link out once to everybody that was registered for the workshop. Um, um, whoever iPhone is, send me a message and give me your email address and I will send it to you. 
Um, I don't know who that is, but, but yeah, thank you all for joining and we're really happy to have you here. And if you found it helpful, please, you know, tell other people and hopefully, um, hopefully we will see you in class and, and I'm doing that free essay workshop on Wednesday. So definitely feel free to register for that too. And yeah, there are five sessions for the UBE, same price. Yep. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. You can stop the recording, Noelle.